All right, good morning, everyone. Um, good Chodesh. It's, no, it's Rosh Chodesh at the time of this recording. It's Rosh Chodesh uh, Elul, Tavshin Pei Dalit, the end of the year of Tavshin Pei Dalit. And let's start the class off by giving charity. Wonderful thing to do, started the day off giving charity. It says that before you pray, to God, you're supposed to give charity. So if there's no poor person around, which is the case, we're in this room, so we put it in this charity box. And you can give charity and demand from God things. So we're demanding Mashiach now. We're demanding Hashem should protect all of our soldiers and transform all of our enemies, either to be friends or to be ended whoever it is, there shouldn't be enemies anymore, that the whole world should be happy and filled with blessing. Charity. Good. Now, I have all these things with stories on them. I write down the stories in the beginning of the week so that it'll be all orderly. And then I misplace the stories. Okay. Next. All right. We're learning now a Mimer, a Hasidic discourse from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And this is because there is no uh, Mimer, there's no essay in the book, Lakuti Torah from the first Rebbe of Chabad, which we usually learn, but there is no Mimer. So we're learning this, and this is very beautiful. And essentially it's talking about what happens on Rosh Hashanah. <clears throat> now, as we said before, uh, Rosh Hashanah is a holiday that only the Jews celebrate. It's a Jewish holiday. Nobody else has a holiday. Like Jewish. What's Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah is New Year's Day. Only the Jews celebrate New Year's Day. Is that true? Well, what are we celebrating New Year's Day? The day that God created the world. Or more exact, the sixth day of creation. When God finished creating the world, God created man. The day that man was created. That's what we're celebrating. So this is really the birthday of the world. Right? When, a, when, a, when a child, when is your birthday? When you're finished, when the child is finished in the womb, it develops. So, the womb, so God took six days to create the world. And when did the world actually come out? When was it finished? Was when man was created. <clears throat> that was the end thing. So that's the birth. That's the birthday of the world. And it's the birthday of man. <clears throat> and essentially it's the same thing because the whole world depends on man. Why? What does it depend on man? What man can eat? He can't eat more than animals. He can't fight more than animals. What can, animal, what can man do that animals can't do that justifies the existence of the world? That man has science, that man has uh, the philosophy, <clears throat> man has art, music. That's the reason God created the world. You have any idea of the beauty that exists in the upper worlds, the harmony? The song of the angels, absolutely nothing compared to the most beautiful symphony that Mahler could write or Beethoven, whatever. But the most beautiful picture that, you know, Rembrandt could draw. <clears throat> There's nothing in, 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 in this world that even compares vaguely to the upper world. So what, what is it about man that justifies the creation of this whole entire world? with all the birds and plants and things like that, what? So it's more logical to say that the world is simply not a creation. It's just sort of developed, you know, from nowhere. Even that's a, that's a little bit sort of weird to say, but it's more logical to say that the world came from something and just developed than to say that God created it. I mean, according to the logic, you can't postulate God's existence. God is, is, the, is creating everything from nothing. So that we can't. So maybe let's say everything just sort of developed. So no, we say Judaism, no, that it's not so. This requires faith. This requires, but every person, every human being has faith. Faith is a basic element in every human being. Whether you use it or not, whether you use it correctly or not is something different, but it's, it's a basic element. So why not use everything to its hilt? And so there's a thing of faith. Generally speaking, in science and in the, 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 the how do you say, the, the exact sciences, what they call, 
is God is not necessary. God is not a necessary element. And even in things like psychiatry, which, you know, I think up to Viktor Frankl was one of the exact sciences. And Professor Viktor Frankl, he pointed out that it's as <clears throat> more, if you want to call it religious or human <clears throat> than any, any human society, any <laughs> human, you know, the, any one of the human sciences can be. What are the, they're not called sciences, what are they called? The human topics are sociology and psychology and this. Simply human. Why? Because 0. 0.00000% 0.1, we understand. And all the rest, we don't really understand. Right? So all of a sudden, faith comes into play. We have to use it. Now the problem is, is to use it properly. Right? So it's not so easy to come to the conclusion that, that faith is a good thing. That's, you know, one in 50 chance. And then to use it properly, that's one in a, a million chance, one in a billion <laughs> to use it properly. And that's what Judaism is. That's what Judaism is. So here the Rebbe is saying is trying to get the Jews to believe in Judaism. Because even for a Jew to actually get the right point, that's also one in, you know, a million, who knows, one in a thousand. Know how many. <clears throat> okay, so one, once a Jew really starts to believe that God exists and he believes in the Torah, then he starts to realize how infinitely far away he is from the creator, but how every deed that he does that, that the creator wants him to do makes him infinitely, infinitely close, closer to God than he is to himself. And that's the whole Tanya is based on. Okay, very close. So what happens on Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah is the day that man was created. And the reason that God created man was that man has something that is not found in any of the other worlds, and that is called <clears throat> making the proper decisions. Or more exactly, choosing what is often against our nature. All the upper worlds, all the worlds, whole create, everything goes according to its nature. Everything. The planets, the animals, the angels. And man has the ability to go against his nature and do exactly what God wants. Okay, that's what God wants. So we see that the first man was created. Happy birthday, Adam. Well, it wasn't such a happy day for Adam. The fact is, it's a pretty, pretty bad day. <laughs> pretty, pretty, maybe one of the most disappointing birthdays that ever was. Probably most of a disappointing birthday. I mean, everybody else after Adam. Your birthday is terrible. The birthday is the worst day. You're brought from heaven. The soul is brought from heaven, where the soul was just basking in the oneness and the love and the harmony and the beauty of the creator. And then it came into this world, and there's no beauty, and there's no harmony, there's no nothing, and the child is totally helpless, and he's screaming and crying with this, right? But then things get better. Things get better. The child grows. He recognizes his parents. He gets love. He gives love, he, he, he develops, he can be this. But with man, Adam, it was exactly the opposite. Adam was put into the world, and he wasn't taken from the highest levels of heaven to be put into the He was put into the world because he felt that God wants him to be here. And he felt that he was doing God's work. And he felt that this is the best place to be in this world and to have responsibility. And he messed it up. He messed it up. Okay, I mean, he was under tremendous pressure. That if we were on such pressure, we would never would, uh, you know. So, given the, given the conditions that he was in, you know, he didn't do that bad of a job. I mean, he's got really, you know, good excuses, mitigating circumstances, like they say. But the fact is, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. So, we are doing what what Adam was supposed to do. We are doing it. And what is that? We are changing our nature to be according to the way God wants. And the way God creates the world is not the way he wants it to remain. It's the way he wanted it to be, but not how he wants it to remain. Just like the same thing with circumcision. And God creates <clears throat> men with foreskin, and God wants Jewish men to remove the foreskin. Why not just leave it natural? Because the whole point of the Torah is is what is natural is not necessarily good. Could be good, right? To have children, to love your children, that's good. To be honest, it's good if it's natural to you. <clears throat> but there are things that are natural that are not good. 
And those things are the, usually the hardest <clears throat> to change. So that's what we have to do. Same thing, charity, right? God wants there to be poor people so that we'll give them charity so they should not remain poor. The same thing with the world. The world is in terrible shape. God made the world very frustrating and confusing. That's the way he wants it to be, but he doesn't want it to remain that way. He wants us to change it. And that's the holiday of Rosh Hashanah. On Rosh Hashanah, we change the world. How do we change the world? So he says, one way is by seeing that God is creating the world brand new every moment, and that it is not our world, that it is God's world. And all the time, <coughs> all the time that we think that it is our world, so that's what we have to change. That's exactly what we have to change. The most natural, normal, logical feeling of the world, that the world is natural, just, you know, just goes according to nature, and that's it. Those laws of nature. And we're saying all the laws of nature are really miracles, and that the whole world is a big miracle. And God is doing this miracle. He's doing it every single instant. The world is God's world, and he's making this miracle, making the world the way it is, that there's thieves in the world, and there's bad in the world, and there's lies in the world, and there's the pain in the world. He's making it this way. God's creating it all. That there's the Hamas in the world, and there's United Nations in the world, all these dastardly evil things. And he's doing it so that we should change it. <clears throat> okay, so how do we change it? First of all, we have to realize that it's God's world, number one, and that God is creating it. Number two, we have to realize that God wants us to change it. Number three, we have to realize that we have the power to change it. And number four, we have to actually change it. Okay, so how do we change it? How do we change the world? So first of all, the Rebbe says, according to Kabbalah, this world is created, and the physical, physicality of this world is created from the last letter of God's name, hey. And that's what it means, kise, covered over the hay of God's name. <clears throat> and we have to reveal it. Okay, then the Rebbe explains that when, when is that we have to reveal it? On this day that of Rosh Hashanah. Why only on a special day? Why on a special day? We're I thought we were supposed to connect the, this limited world to God that's unlimited. So, you know, what difference does it make? So it says the Rebbe, no, we don't understand. God is creating the world not just to conceal himself. God is creating the world to reveal himself. God wants to be revealed in every detail of the world. And that's what it means. The word kesa means covering over hay. But the word kesa also means a special time. The time itself is special. Time itself is a miracle. And each time has its own unique godliness that we have to bring out. <clears throat> and that's what happens on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is that unique time because before God created the world, there was no time. There was no before. Right? When God created the world 5,780, another month, five years ago, right? When he created the world, that's when before began. That's when before and after began. Right? And before he created, God created the world, there was the, the principles of time that existed. <clears throat> but that wasn't really time. Is it? Okay, so when we do what we're supposed to do on Rosh Hashanah, on this day, then that gives not only significance and meaning and blessing and reveals the truth in the physical world, but also in the temporal world, in time Good. Okay, so that's what the Rebbe said. That's quoting the Baal Shem Tov, that every moment has to be new, and that also the time, the Magid of Mesrich, his pupil said that time is a creation. Okay, that's where we go. Really, okay. That really, everything is a miracle. It's brand new. That's what we've learned up to now. Huh? Pretty interesting. So in other words, what's the Rebbe saying? The revelation of godliness in the world doesn't mean that the world is going to go away. It means that the negative things will go away, but the world will remain exactly the way it is, <clears throat> just without all the negativity. <clears throat> Where does the negativity come from? Mostly from man. <laughs> Mostly from man. I mean, God does make man, and he makes the possibility to do negative things. So there is some negative negativity 
or potential negative on God's part. And the Tanya explains that all this concealment of the world comes from God's severity, his power, his severity. And that severity in the upper worlds is very good. But when it's too much in this world, it's not balanced off by love, then that comes bad. So the source of all bad in the world comes from this side of what's called God's gavura, his severity that we have to. So that's why there is bad in the world. It's an aspect of godliness, but not tempered. Huh? They say not balanced. Okay. So that's what Rosh Hashanah is. That's what we said Rosh Hashanah is the first day. We're just doing repetition of what we said. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> just as when man was created, he was supposed to bring completion and meaning and blessing into place and into time. So it is every single year. Every single year. That's why it depends on Adam. That's the idea of Adam, man. Man, Adam. Because he is ed adame, he is similar to God. In other words, the same way that God created the world in six days, as we maintain and change the world, <clears throat> also the same thing every day of the week, every day of the year, but especially on Rosh Hashanah. That's the day when the whole business began and man was created. That's the first man. <clears throat> so as I said before, that's the whole idea of the Jewish people. The Jewish people. Now, everybody really, the fact is, everyone in the world is chosen. Nothing in the world happens by accident. And everyone is here because God chose him to be here. But the Jewish people, they're called the chosen people because we were chosen to tell everybody exactly this. Exactly that, how special they are in God's eyes. That's what we're chosen for. And the first one to start this was Abraham. And he passed that down to all the Jews. Okay, the Jews are not exactly, uh, you know, running around and doing this. A lot of the Jews are occupied in totally wrong directions. And that's the idea of <clears throat> the Rebbe. The Rebbe is coming to wake up all these Jews in the world. So that, that's the, what we're learning here. And one of these Jews that's really lost is me. Every all of us. Suddenly we realize this. We learn this. We realize how far away we are from the... <clears throat> doing, revealing our potential. So every single Jew has the power to change the whole world. <clears throat> okay, so now the Rebbe said the whole purpose of the creation of the world is that God wants to be living here in this world. That's the idea of the shofar. The shofar is, shofar means to be pledged, gives pleasure. The word shofar means shufra, means pleasure. Shofar means also shapru masechem, improve, to make things Perfect, perfect, to perfect what you're doing, to make them according to the way they should be. And amazingly enough, this God give, this gives God pleasure. God is so intimately involved in every detail of the world that when we when we do what he wants, he gets pleasure. That's this is a pleasing spirit to God. Okay. <laughs> so the Rebbe said, okay, so, so here we have one way of revealing godliness in the world is by thinking. Another word, way of revealing godliness in the world is sounding the shofar, <clears throat> right? When I say thinking means contemplating all that we said before, that it's God's world. God is creating us. God wants us to serve him. God wants us to improve the world. Every human being is important. The Jews are here to tell every human being how important they were, they are, and etc. Okay, a way of a, that's one way of doing it. Thinking, having being in the proper attitude, the proper mindset, the proper <clears throat> awareness of what's going on, how important our service of God is to change the world. Okay. Another way is by the shofar, sounding the shofar. That <clears throat> is a commandment, and it's a commandment that the, the commandment itself symbolizes what happens in the commandment. <clears throat> it's narrow on one side, wide on the other side. The, this world is also narrow. On one side, we want it to be wide on the other side. And when we do this, it pleases God. So sounding the shofar also makes a big difference in the world. And maybe here, I'll, I'll, I'll write this down. I'll tell you, this will be the story that I'll tell you today. I might have to leave early today. I hope not. Okay, ready? Here we go. <clears throat> so,
So that happens on Rosh Hashanah, and it, that's what's called building God's kingship, Malchut. So first of all, we have to also, now we have to start working. Now, now it gets to sort of the nasty part. We have to get rid of, remove our mind from our negative interests and urges and, uh, how do you say, uh, in, interest, I said that, interests, that negative things that draw us or that push us or that, that, that instigate us or that motivate us, the negative things. We have to get rid of those. <clears throat> we have to get rid of those things. Why do we have negative feelings, desires, etc.? Because we love ourselves. People love themselves. And why do we love ourselves? Because we're close to ourselves. You wake up in the morning, you feel yourself. That's the first thing you feel. The Rebbe even said, there's one mimer where the Rebbe says that, says that man is made in God's image. Right? In the beginning of creation, God said, God made, that God made man in his image. And it says it later on to Noah. It's forbidden to kill people because man is made in God's image. He's talking even non-Jews. Non -Jews. So the Rebbe says in, in one of his discourses, his mimer, that God made us in his image. What does it mean in his image? I know one of the meanings is that everybody has intrinsically a feeling that they are God. I'm made in God's image. What does it mean? I'm God. Why would you say you're God? Because you feel only yourself. You feel that you are the ultimate reality. There's even some people that go on, I mean, to the, the ridiculous, we've talked about this before, that there's a, they say that, you know, they use some or other, they justify this with quantum physics, that because our consciousness affects the world, so maybe our consciousness creates the world. Maybe our consciousness creates all reality. <clears throat> That's what it means. I feel that I am God. Everybody feels that they're God. Okay, why did God do such a bizarre thing like this? That he made it that we think we're God. I mean, it's such an obvious, you know, mistake. Huh? God wants us to serve him. And what does he do? He makes us that we feel we want God to serve us if he exists at all. That's all. That's idolatry. What is idolatry? They make up all these gods to serve them. To serve them. Basically, that's what the other religions are. I mean, you know, the Christianity and the Islam, it's just all for me. What I'm going to get. I'm serving God, so I'll get. So instead of making a thousand gods, so they made two gods, three gods, one god. But still, it's to serve me. It's really not one god. There's really always minimum two gods. There's me, I'm the main god. And then there's the big god in the heavens, right? The, the big god. And the big god, he... He's the cast, he's the, how do I say, the ATM. I do what he says, he'll give me a. <clears throat> so, but really, the fact of the matter is, is that God is totally one. God is totally one. So, why does he make it that we feel that we're separate from God? And even more, that we're dominant, we're, the, we're God. Or maybe there is no God, it's just me. That's all there is, it's just me. He says, the reason God did this is so that we can. But he say extrapolate. We can learn from ourselves. The same way I feel that I'm God because I'm so real. So the same way, that's how you should feel God. How, how, how real God is. The God is really creating me. If I think that I'm real, then I should really, really feel the reality of God. Inside. That's called transforming. That you realize that my whole being is a creation. And that God is creating it. And the only real reality is God's reality. But that's what you should do. So that means receiving God's will on us. Now, God creates the world every second brand new. So as a result, he creates this feeling of egotism also brand new. And we have to change it all the time, constantly, brand new. That's what I mean. That's what's called bitl. Bitl means two things. First of all, negating this false egotism that I have, that I think that I'm God. And second of all, it means not just negating it so I don't do anything, but surrendering it to the creator that I use myself for what God wants me to. I use my hands, for what God wants, my mind, what God wants me to, my eyes, what God wants. And it ends up there's a tremendous leeway over there, right? A tremendous, tremendous leeway. You can use your mind according to, to serving God for everything that's in the world. Like I said before, I don't know if boxing is okay. I don't, I don't really think so, Frank. I mean, you know, it's it's a really interesting sport, but I don't think so bashing people, except for that except for people bashing each other up. 
Except for that, everything, you can use it for everything, but it has to be in a permissible way. That's what's called bitl. Bitl. One, mean bitl means, one meaning of bitl is negating the bad, and the other one means to harmonize the bad with godliness. Harmonize the bad with godliness. And that's what's called making binyan a malchut. The God, you use the world for what God wants. Okay. So it says, and then, now, now we're starting. And it continues over there in the Mimer by the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe in 19... The, all of this that the Rebbe is saying here is a commentary on what the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe said in his discourse on the same name, but in 1947. Okay, so the, the previous Rebbe continues over there and says, the Zehu Gambior, this is an explanation of the Nusach Bracha, of the wording of the blessing of Shofrot. <clears throat> blessing of Shofrot. What is the blessing of Shofrot? What does it mean? It, the prayers are always basically the same. In Judaism, there's what's called the Shmon Asrei. There's what's called the standing prayer. And it's always basically the same. The first three blessings and the last three blessings are always basically the same. On Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the wording is different. It's different. It's a little bit different. The first three blessings, the wording is a little bit different. In the, so, but they're the same. And, but the middle blessing, in the weekdays, <clears throat> we have 13 blessings. On holidays, on Shabbat, on all the holidays, there's only one blessing. One blessing that talks about the Shabbat or talks about the holiday. On Rosh Hashanah, the Musaf prayer of Rosh Hashanah, the second prayer, I guess it's the third prayer. The second prayer in the day of Rosh Hashanah is called Musaf. Second prayer in the daytime is called Musaf, the additional prayer. And in this Musaf prayer, there's the first three blessings, the last three blessings, like all this time we pray the whole year. But in the middle, instead of being one blessing, there's three blessings. Three blessings, the Rosh Hashanah. And the first one is bringing 10 sentences from the Torah, the Torah, the prophets, 10 sentences from the Torah, proving that God is a king. Then we bring, that's the first blessing. That's called <clears throat> Malchiot. Then there's 10 sentences, the second blessing. 10 seconds, sentences saying that God remembers. God remembered Noah, God remembers Avram, God remembers, he remembers. The world is, so to speak, far away from God. We make it that way. And God remembers us no matter what situation we're in. That's the second. So there's Malchiot, three, three middle blessings in this Musaf prayer. The first is God is a king. The second, the God remembers. And the third one is called Shofrot. Ten sentences from the Torah. Usually it's four sentences from the five books of Moses and three sentences from the prophets and three sentences from the writings that say that God listens to the Shofar. Shofar. Okay? So that's the... So in... And this blessing has wording. How is it? How is it worded? And the wording is that God Shomea call Truat Amo Yisrael Barachamim. That God hears the sound of the Terua of the blasting of the shofar. Terua is this is the last shofar blast. Amo Yisrael of the Jewish people Barachamim in mercy. So the word Terua, the word Terua really means several things. In the shofar, the word teruah means a shofar blast, right? Shua, vahavirta, vahavarta, teruah b'kol It says in the, the jubilee year, teruah. It means it's a shofar blast. More exactly, the word teruah is one of the three sounds that we make when we sound the shofar. There's a tekiah, shvorim, Du, 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 and trua. Du, 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 That's a trua. Okay. But the word trua itself has also different implications. The word trua also means rava, brotherhood, love. Trua. And the word trua also means to break, to smash. Here we say the trua, the word trua, this is the Indian of shvira, breaking. Breaking a humriot vayeshut, breaking your physicality, your your you know, this your 
mundaneness and your crassness, breaking it. Egotism, false egotism, selfishness, breaking your selfishness. Oh, that's good. And <clears throat> sometimes it's called breaking your heart. Leave Shavur. Sha'alya they said that by means of this, Poalim, it brings about Shahamalchut that God's kingship to Yeah, but Bechinus Gile or should be revealed. <clears throat> so, like I say, there's two possibilities of who's going to be king over the world. Or God or me. That's there's no other. Either God is the king or I'm the king. There's no if stands up on um, who knows Nebuchadnezzar or Stalin or someone says so uh, he's the king. No, he makes everybody worry for themselves. Everybody becomes afraid for themselves. But everybody's still thinking about themselves. <clears throat> <clears throat> right? That was the whole thing of the Hasidic Chabad in Russia. There were also other Jews in Russia, but Hasidic Chabad it was like a natural thing for them because of the Rebbe. There were other Jews also who were tremendously self-sacrificing in Russia. But in Chabad, it was a, what is this idea of self-sacrificing? That Stalin is not the boss, and I'm not the boss, and I'm not worried about me, and I'm not worried about Stalin. I am only worried about doing what God wants. That's called self-sacrifice. And that is signified in the sounding of the shofar. Sounding of the shofar is you break your selfishness. But when you break your selfishness, automatically God appears. Automatically there's godliness. There are these religions like in, in um, I mean, generally a basic thing of religion was self-mortification. Right, especially the, the, the Indians, Hindus, there's certain sects and groups that are, they devote themselves totally to this. There's groups that they stand on their hands all the time, they sit on a bed of nails, and who knows what they do. Okay, but those people are also doing it for themselves. It's not that they're breaking themselves. They're trying to break their lower self for higher, it's like going into business. You go into business, you have to not get excited. Control yourself, don't get excited, don't get angry, don't jump to conclusions, don't do these natural things. But you're doing it for yourself. How to win friends and influence people. The best, right, best example. There's a book which is called, famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Famous book, it was written more than 100 years ago, right? And it tells you how to not listen to your first impulses, how to control yourself, but it's all for me. It's all what I get. They all get. The shofar is saying, forget about this all me and what I get. God creates you, he'll take care of you. Don't worry about it, right? He's creating, he's creating the whole world. He knows what he's doing. You don't know what you're doing. You think you do know what you're doing. You're making a mistake. And the show for blows is that's stopping that mistake. I'm not going to be an egotist anymore. I'm going to at least try to give myself over to God. Like I say, it's not so, it's not saying, so, okay, I have done it. And now I have reached enlightenment. And no, it's every second you have to do brand new. <clears throat> but still, it's, it's a thing of harmony and beauty that becomes in a way easier and easier to do. Eventually, it becomes transformed. It says it's not so difficult. That's the idea of a tzaddik. A tzaddik has transformed this. Okay, but we have to, to a certain degree, so we have to break our selfishness. And by means of this, what do we reveal? The curtain goes away. The curtain comes up, and we see a little bit of, feel a little bit of godliness. We feel the world is not mine. It's God's world. I am being created. Wow, this is amazing. And therefore, the Yom Tov, the, 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 the Yom Tov of Rosh Hashanah that falls to be Shabbos. Now, in this year, <clears throat> this, this year that the Rebbe spoke in 1987, Rosh Hashanah fell on Shabbat. So a lot of this is going to talk about the topic of Rosh Hashanah falling on Shabbat. When Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, you don't sound the shofar. Now, Rosh Hashanah is always two days. Rosh, the holiday of Rosh Hashanah is a two-day holiday. Two-day holiday. And it's the only holiday in Judaism that's two days of holiday. All the others, they have a holiday, and then they have intermediate days. But this is a two-day holiday, Rosh Hashanah. And outside of Israel, there's a lot of holidays that have two days, but they say the first day is from the Torah, and the second day is from the rabbis. Rabbi. Okay, but Rosh Hashanah is two days of, of holiday from the Torah. 
from the Torah. The two days equal of importance. So if one of those days falls on Shabbat, and it can only be the first day, if, the, if one of those days falls on Shabbat, what do, one second. No, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. In Adu Rosh. That's right, yeah, 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 that's right, okay. If one of those days falls, and the first day, if the first day of Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, then you don't sound the shofar. You don't sound the shofar on the first day. Of, you don't sound, when do you sound the shofar? On the second day. On the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And, okay, even though the both first both days are from the Torah, but nevertheless, the second day is less important. Okay, so, okay. The second day of Rosh Hashanah, you, you, if the first day of Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, you don't sound the shofar. Okay, so what? why don't you sound the shofar? We just finished explaining the shofar is so tremendously important and that it reveals godliness in the world and it breaks, it gives God pleasure. We said teruah means shofar, means pleasure. It gives God pleasure and it breaks the lies of the world. It's so important. And how can it be that when Shabbat comes, we don't sound the shofar? How can it be? <clears throat> okay, there's a whole memorandum which are written about this. And we're not going to go into this, why we don't build a show. We're going to say what, how Shabbat takes the place of sounding the shofar. It says, <clears throat> if the first day of Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, like it was on this year when the Rebbe was speaking, let me just get my pointer over here. <clears throat> then we don't sound the shofar. Why? The fee because Shabbat, Shabbat that Shabbat itself in avoda ba'ofen the shvir of a biru. Because on Shabbat we don't get rid of the bad. The Shabbat borer asur. There's 39 general categories of work that are forbidden on Shabbat, and <clears throat> one of them is. If you have food or whatever, you can't take the bad away from the good, right? You have, let's say, 100 peas. You love to eat peas, but there's one piece of corn that's in the middle of the piece. So you take the piece of corn out, you put it to the side, you eat the peas. You just did a sin. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can take the good from the bad, but you can't take the bad from the good. There's a lot of laws involved, but that's generally. Borer is forbidden. And what are we saying? Sounding the shofar... It gets rid of the bad from the good. It gets rid of the selfishness from the world. And that you can't do. It's forbidden. You can't do it. We're just going to leave the bad there. Shabbat, it's like, it's a, what do you say, a free zone or something. It runs away. Tama Davar, the reason is, Mishum Shabbat and Shabbat is the completion and the true idea of this physical world. That doesn't have to be any refinement. Okay, what's it saying? There's a, a midrash that says that. <clears throat> and, and, no, I'm sorry. It's it's a it's a lacha, it's a, the Gemara. And the the end of the Gemara is is that even a person who is you know there's laws who you can eat by if you can eat by a person if a person says you know I took the tithes from my food in Israel I took the tithes from my food. You don't necessarily believe him. So on Shabbat, you do believe him because you believe even a person that's an ignoramus will not lie on Shabbat. It's difficult for him to lie on Shabbat. Okay, we see people do lie on Shabbat, but nevertheless, it's more difficult. People always <clears throat> have free will, no matter what. <clears throat> free will. So, But nevertheless, on Shabbat, it says there's less bad in the world. The world is more godly and it's less selfish. Shabbat. That's why we don't work on Shabbat. We don't do things that, that show that we're the boss on Shabbat. Light fires, write letters, all these things that we're in control of. We don't do on Shabbat. It's forbidden to do on Shabbat. Because Shabbat is God's day. God does everything. In other words, there's n there isn't bad that has to be fixed up. So on Shabbat, there's two things. Number one, on Shabbat, it's forbidden to get rid of the bad. Therefore, you don't sound the shofar because that's... And not only that, on Shabbat, it's not necessary to get rid of the bad because Shabbat itself does the job. 
Shabbat itself does the job of sounding the shofar. It's a revelation of godliness in the world. Okay, I mean, listen, I don't feel these things. Maybe a little, maybe it could be, I do a little bit. It could be, could be actually. Could be psychological, could be. But the Rebbe is saying that this is really what's happening, and I believe what he's saying. And that's what he considered. <clears throat> nevertheless, in the Mikdash, in the Holy Temple, they would sound the shofar on Shabbat. Why? Because in the Holy Temple, and there, every, even though everything was fixed up, but it was fixed up to such a high degree that when we sounded the shofar, it wasn't to get rid of the bad. It was only to draw more good in the world. <clears throat> the Holy Temple was pure. <clears throat> that the physical world was just the way it was supposed to be. Well, so therefore, in the Holy Temple, you could sound the shofar even on Shabbat. Why? Because sounding the shofar on Shabbat, this is not the thing of removing the bad from the good, because there was no bad to remove. But it was just revealing more godliness, nilit yoter, in the physicality of the world. That's what we've said so many times. When Mashiach comes, we'll have to work even harder. We'll have to do commandments and work even harder. But the work won't be to get rid of the bad. It'll be revealing more and more good. More and more good. It's almost like, like anything. You know, you people, these people in sports and music, and they become very good. At their, they're professional. Professional pianist, totally different level than, uh, than, but in professional pianists themselves, there's higher and higher and higher levels. And, and if you ask the top pianist in the world, he'll say, oh, there's much better levels than I am. You know, there's much, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working for perfection, but uh, you know, it's far away from me. <clears throat> so no matter in, uh, if that's the way it is in music or in sports or whatever, how much more so it is, in godliness, in good, in the source of good, the source of beauty, the source of victory. As Ulai, maybe we can also add on this, a pity you do according to what's known, that in the holy temple, in the holy of holies, the place of the Aaron, of the ark, is Enu Minamida. It says in the holy of holies, there was the ark was there, it had the tablets in it, and it was an exact measurement. The ark had to be two and a half almas long and two, and two what is it, the, the, the with two and a half amas, one ama high and one ama, oh, it had to be exact measurements, actual measurements. But once a year, they would lower someone from the roof into the Holy of Holies to clean the place up. They would clean it up and they would measure to see if the ark was exactly in the right place. And that it had to be in the right place, but it wasn't measured. There was no measure. How exactly they measured, I don't know. But it says that the, the ark itself was, 10, um, was, was two and a half amas. And the room itself was 20 amas. But when they measured it, there was 10 amas from one side of the ark and 10 amas from the other side of the ark. In other words, the ark didn't take any place. So how can it possibly be? The ark was measured. It was there. And the room that it was in was there. You measured 10 amas from each side of the ark. <clears throat> and also the ark itself was measured. It had to be two and a half amas long and one one and a half amas, one and a half amas high and one and a half amas deep. So it was physical. It was a physical thing there. But together with this, it was not measured. Because the physical world was exactly the way it was supposed to be. What does it mean? That the world was a world. The ark was there, the room was there, the room had exact measurements, but when you measured it, it didn't work out. It ended up that the ark wasn't there. Our ark wasn't there, but it was there, it had to be there. It was one of the necessary ingredients of the holy temple. It says now that the, when the first temple was destroyed, before it was destroyed, that the ark was put down into this hidden place under the <clears throat> temple. King Solomon prepared this hidden place because the, the temple can't be without an ark. There has to be an ark, and, and the tablets have to be there. <clears throat> there. But on the other hand, when you measure it, they weren't there. It wasn't the, So that's the way the whole world is supposed to be. It's supposed to be that it's here, but we realize it's God's world. It's not our world. As we'll talk about more, God willing, tomorrow. Now let's learn the Dvar Malchut.